Since the start of the year, the Daily Rundown has been introducing you to the newest members of Congress. In today's edition, it's a lesson of if at first you don't deed, try, try again. Mark Takano first ran for Congress in 1992. He ended up losing in one of the closest congressional races in California history. He lost again in 1994 in a nasty rematch. 18 years later, Takano decided to run one more time in a newly redrawn 41st district, going on to beat a moderate Republican to become the first openly gay person of color in Congress. Born and raised in California, Takano decided to bypass law school after graduating from Harvard to work in inner city schools in Boston and California. And he now hopes to take the lessons he learned from his days in the classroom to the House chamber. Joining me now, Congressman Mark Takano, thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you, Luke. Good to be here. I want to start off with an issue that is important to you, obviously, with California and Prop 8, and, uh, and, and, and in, in this case, now moving towards the Supreme Court, and that's DOMA. This is what your leader, uh, Nancy Pelosi, has to say to, had to say about it yesterday. I believe that DOMA is unconstitutional, and I believe that the Republicans know it. I know it's unconstitutional. So where we sit now in March of 2013, how much do you think the likelihood of this being repealed is? I think it's very likely. Public opinion has moved uh, uh, tremendously, uh, incredibly fast. Um, I think uh, right now uh, it's allowed Republicans uh, actually to um, come out in favor. There's like a, a hundred prominent Republicans who issued a brief uh, uh, endorsing marriage equality uh, before the Supreme Court. I like to say that common sense has come out of the closet. Mm -hmm. As a uh, openly gay person of color, obviously the first person elected to Congress in, in that capacity, how have you sort of found it working with members on the other side of the aisle? Has it come up at all, or do you feel it, we've now come to a point of where you know inclusion is pretty much the norm, especially in the halls of power? Well, I've only been in Congress for two and a half months. Uh, I have five other colleagues in the House. Uh, uh, two others who were elected as openly gay candidates, uh, and I haven't seen any untoward uh, kind of behavior, uh, any kind of antagonism from my Republican colleagues. Uh, uh, you know, there are conversations, uh, you know, working out at the gym. There's all sorts of ways in which we interact, and I, I frankly haven't seen any kind of uh, antagonism or animosity. I want to turn uh, my atten the attention to something that you're very passionate on, and that has to do with entitlements. Uh, we want to put up a quote that you and Alan Grayson, the representative from Florida, had, which had said, quote, We will vote against any and every cut to Medicare, Medicaid, or Social Security benefits, including raising the retirement age or cutting the cost of living adjustments that our constituents earned in need. Now, we know that the Medicare and Social Security, both will become insolvent. Uh, Medicare, around 2024, most people think. Social Security, sometime in the 2030s. Do you think that there's the same type of intransigence that Republicans have towards raising taxes that perhaps Democrats like you and Mr. Grayson have towards reforming entitlements in any capacity? Well, I, I think of these programs as promises that America has made to our seniors. And I call them sacred promises. Uh, people, I think, want to use other language like entitlements uh, because it would make them easier to cut. Um, I don't think, I wasn't raised to break promises. Uh, people have earned these benefits over a lifetime. Uh, they deserve them. They're rightfully, they rightfully take ownership of them. Uh, and I'm here in Congress to fight for them. Let's say down the road, President mm -hmm. Obama, through this budget process with congressional Republicans, they come to some sort of grand bargain which takes a deep uh, knife to, to entitlements or earned benefits, whatever we like to say. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think there'd be a sizable, in exchange for revenue, do you think there'd be a sizable group of House Democrats that would oppose this type of deal? Well, I, I can't speculate on some hypothetical situation in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, what I want to do right now is shape this debate. Um, and I want to just remind the President, remind my colleagues, uh, that we did make promises to our seniors. Uh, the impact to them would be tremendous. Um, you know, people who reach 65, people need Medicare. They've, they've banked on it. They've planned for it. Uh, Social Security, uh, this is something that they have earned over a lifetime. And for us to change the nature of the agreement we made with them 
actually more than agreement, we made a promise. Uh, my, my belief is that uh, right at this moment, uh, I have to voice and telegraph how I feel uh, to the president. The people of my district, mm -hmm. uh, I think, definitely stand behind uh, me, and I'm representing them, and I'm, I'm being their voice. Uh, you're from the Riverside area of California. Obviously, there's an Air Force base around there. Uh, as a first-term member of Congress, you're in a few months here. Yes. What are you hearing from your constitu constituents directly regarding the sequester? Are they being very vocal about it at this point? Have they started to feel it, or there's just a sort of general anxiety? I think there's general anxiety. Um, we've talked to some of the base commanders, and they've let us know about some of the things uh, and personnel that we cut or furloughed. Uh, it's $500 million uh, local impact. Uh, it's tremendous. We already are suffering from 11% unemployment, mm -hmm. some of the highest unemployment in the state of California and the nation. Uh, sequester, the sequester will have a direct impact on my community that's already suffering from high unemployment. And, and my fear is that uh, people are, are, are simply not feeling the cuts right now. But the president has been doing, I think, a tremendous job trying to point to real consequences if this sequester goes through 750,000 mm -hmm. jobs nationwide if the sequester is allowed to go through. Mark Takenow from California, thank you.